Hi everyone. Um, so I'm Matt Henriksen. I work um, in the engineering and design group at Data61, which is a part of CSIRO. Um, and I'm going to talk a bit about our uh, web mapping platform, Terrio.js. Um, so yeah, I'm not Kevin Ring. Uh, it would have been great if Kevin was here. Uh, he's unfortunately fallen ill. So I'm going to uh, try and do as good a job as he could do. I'm not as technical as Kevin is by any means. He's a you know, genius level person. But uh, I'll, I'll do my best to cover what, we, what we've done with Terrio. So first of all, why have we got Terrio.js? Well, it kind of started, it actually started back in 2014. Um, we were getting a lot of interest from government, from federal government, about how they wanted everything to be open. And then in 2015, the prime minister of the time, uh, Malcolm Turnbull, released a uh, public data policy statement saying that it, effectively uh, Australian government should be open by default, uh, meaning open data, open source, everything open. We as citizens has paid for all the data by our taxes. Um, and it should be open so that everybody can use it and get benefit from it. So what was needed was a uh, solution to showcase, to be able to uh, get the Australian government spatial data out. And so that brings a few unique requirements. Um, it has to be federated because all the government departments, they, they have a feel that they want to stay in control of their data. So they want to keep their data on their servers, and they're not going to let CSIRO or anybody else get a copy of that data and hold it centrally in one spot. So whatever solution we develop, we have to be talking directly to the data custodian and not make copies of the data. It has to be usable. Um, so it has to be usable by my mum. And, it, and then it has to wide, you know, the, the range of people has to be usable by goes all the way to the experts in this room um, who do GIS for a living. Um, it has to support the majority of uh, formats and service types. So there's heaps and heaps of different formats and service types in the different government departments that we work with. So ESRI, GeoJSON, KML, all this kind of stuff, right? So we have to be able to try and do the best effort to show the majority of those. Um, it has to be open, so we have, we've made it open source. We follow as many open standards as we can, um, only developing new things when we have to, when there's absolutely no alternative. Um, and this is just to avoid the uh, vendor lock-in so that the, everybody, uh, the citizens can use the data and they don't have to pay for Esri or something like that to use it. Um, it has to be forward thinking. So. Things are becoming more 3D. We're getting more data that's 3D, so we have to be able to display the 3D data and use it um, so that um, we're, we're ready for the future. And we have to be able to show changes as they happen in the world. So we have to be time aware. Um, we have to be able to show things from 100 years ago if we got that data, and we have to compare it to today, or you know, forecast of 100 years. right? So out of this, National Map was born. And National Map is an open website. Anybody can go there. Um, there's a range of other maps as well that I'll talk a little bit about later. Um, and National Map at the moment has over 10,000 geospatial data sets because it connects to data.gov.au. So whenever a government department publishes a geospatial data set on there, it's, it becomes available straight away on National Map. Um, the quote on the side is from one of Malcolm Turnbull's uh, chief advisors, and he said, funding National Map was one of the best procurement decisions I've made, which is very nice to hear. Um, so, but what about Terry Jacks? So we made National Map first, and then we got a lot of requests saying, hey, we want a map like that. And so we thought, okay, well, let's turn this into a platform. We extracted the common core which we're now calling Terry.js, and we have a little layer on top that turns it into national map, or another little layer on top that turns it into a Remi or the NEAI viewer or any of the other several maps that we do. Um, so Terry.js, the platform, is basically um, a JavaScript application over here on the left that runs on your, in your browser. Um, that's where all the magic happens, really. Um, it's all, it's, it, pretty much runs as an application on your desktop computer. Um, it is delivered over the web, 
so that the majority of people can use it. Um, but it does run on your laptop, if you like. There's a little server component in the middle. It has some kind of some services that might be required, some proxying if that's required, um, sharing URLs, that sort of thing. Um, but for the majority of data, the application running in your laptop reaches out straight to the data sources at the data custodians um, and gets them back. And I'll, I'll talk more about that. Only if it has to does it go through our proxy to the other proxy data sources. So some of the features. Um, it has a federated data catalog. So you can see on this list, this is from National Map. Um, it talks to all the state governments. It talks straight to their CCAN servers, or the CSW servers, or the Socrata servers. Um, it talks to WMS. It does a get capability and renders all the layers. Um, and so the catalog is very, very large now. And it reaches out straight to the data custodians to get the layers from there. Um, we can show raster layers. That's nothing uh, stunning, right? It's, you've seen that in Leaflet, things like that. Things that are a bit different here. We have a time control over here. Um, and we have some other kind of tools and things that you can use. Um, we can show vector layers. We can show raster layers and vector layers together. Um, we can do region mapping. So if you have a CSV file in Excel spreadsheet with a postcode column, you can drag and drop that on the map and we'll fill in the postcodes or your LGAs or your SA regions, or your whatever you have, right? Um, in this case, for instance, we did a map um, specifically for the, um, uh, the marriage equality survey. Um, we can show charts. So here we're showing real-time uh, power generation uh, from our big power stations in Australia. And so every five minutes, we get another time generation value, and this chart ticks along a little bit. <coughs> um, we can do 3D. So um, on the right, you have terrain. On the left, you have the city of Brisbane. Um, so we're, this is the forward kind of looking. We're going into more and more 3D data. Um, works well on the mobile. And on the mobile, we have a prototype um, augmented reality mode. So you hold up your phone and you turn around and the view turns around so you can see kind of what's, what would be ahead of you. Oh. There's a split screen. Um, you can put, you know, the same layer at different times, 1980 on the left, 1990 on the right, whatever, um, or different layers all together. In this case, it's two different satellites, Landsat 7 on the left and Landsat 8 on the right um, for two different times, just to kind of make it easy to compare things. Um, so these ones here on the left is a, a small selection of the maps that we do for federal government. And for uh, Geoglam is CSIRO, um, and so on. Um, the ones on the right are people who have just taken our open source platform and just run their own. And that's great. That's what we want, right? Um, if you want to check some of this stuff out, you can head to Terra.io. That's the place to go. And it, things link off there. Um, or go to GitHub. Focus on GitHub. Um, like and subscribe. Uh, we've got Gitter for chatting with us so that you know, we can help everybody develop their maps. Um, and then let's do a live demo. <coughs> so I talked about national map. I'll show some other maps. Um, this is the Arimi maps for renewable data. Um, so like you saw before, it's a 3D map, right? Or if, it's, if your computer isn't fast enough for that, it can go to leaflet mode. Uh, but by default, it uses cesium. Um, we have a curated data catalog. Is that big enough? Yes, probably. And so before we showed the generation, so I can quickly switch on our generation values here. Um, we can look at something like the Ningen solar farm. We can show seven days of generation, and we can compare that to um, a wind farm, for instance, um, to see how that changes over time. We can download all those values as well, since it's all open data. Um, we can, so say that you are a, uh, a renewable energy company, like Neowen or something like that. Um, you want to look at where you want to put your next solar farm. So you might, then you might then turn on where are the other solar farms. 
Um, you're probably going to want to think about what's the transmission lines like, because it's very expensive to build transmission lines. And so this is the transmission grid network of Australia. Um, and then, of course, you can click on those to find out kind of what are the, the rough parameters of that. Um, after that, you're probably starting to be interested in what is the solar resource that I've got available to me. <coughs> I actually had a different one. Um, so if we add the monthly solar, what we can do then is, as you can see here, uh, in December, uh, we have uh, monsoon conditions in the north, and we have dry conditions in the south. So we have a lot of sun in the south, but actually not so much in the north. We can split this, and we can put one of them to be in um, June, for instance. And then we can see, when we have the dry season in the north, we have wet and cold and rainy in Melbourne. Uh, and then you can compare using the slider, or you can get the actual value for each of these points. Um, then you might want to look at infrastructure like roads, or you probably want to get into boundaries um, like cadaster and land tenure, um, or maybe you want to look at the prohibited defense areas to make sure that you know you don't put your solar farm or you, um, anywhere close to any of those areas. Um, maybe you want to look at natural resource management regions to make sure that you're not doing anything uh, where there's a, a sensitive natural resource um, area. Um, and like I said, there's many other maps. So we make an investor map for Austrade um, to be used for investing in Australia. Things if you want to build a new lithium mine. Um, for instance, then you can look in here if you want to um, <coughs> invest in you know, any kind of uh, geospatial, uh, where you need geospatial information. Hopefully, we have it all in here. Um, there's the NEAI map for Bureau of Meteorology. Um, so we build many of these kind of maps, right? Um, But so, in summary, um, it's you know we like to think it's even innovative. We like to think that we're helping government to put the data out there. Uh, it seems to be quite popular, at least, um, as you saw in the usage numbers on the national map. Um, it's used by federal, state, local government. Um, it's used by uh, international people. Uh, it's used by individuals, people with a, an itch to scratch. They go and just fork it, and they run up their own map. Um, so we'd like to think that we unlock not just government, but you know, many different forms of spatial data. Um, and we're hiring. So if anybody would like to work with this, uh, with us, then uh, come talk to us. I think that's all I got. Thank you. The right question from me. You're saying that you've tried to make it so your mum can use it. Yes. Um, do journalists use it? Watching social media and, and general media on the energy debate, I'm not seeing a lot of evidence. Yep. Uh, so we would like them to use it. In general, they possibly use simpler maps, even simpler than what we have. So yes, I would like my mum to use it. And she can use it. I've seen her use it. Um, it could be simpler. We are starting to get quite a lot of different features everywhere. So it, for when you're going to publish something on Twitter or just a simple um, article, there it is probably easier to make a customized map with just the one thing that you want to show, to just remove, remove all of the choice for people. Uh, I also agree there's some features that are quite hidden, so um, uh, that would be really nice to have some kind of help or guided um, advice to how yep. you can create a, a simple map and, and see some of that. I didn't know some of that worked, so that's very interesting. Um, 
So there isn't really a tutorial like that or a, a site that is easy to get into that. Any of the, um, so the national map is the front page. It is, because it has so many layers uh, in the catalog, it is actually getting to the point that it's quite difficult to use. So using a Remi or the investor map is probably easier to start off with uh, because it's much more a tightly curated set of layers. Um, it has really kind of customized features. So using one of those is probably easier, yes. Yep. So. Um, yep. Okay. Um, so if you were to go to any of our maps, click Add Data. You can add web data. So it takes any of the um, kind of well-known service types. So you can just paste in an ArcGIS map server URL or a WMS URL or a CSV URL or something like that um, to your data. And you should hopefully, with some caveats, it will show up. And you can then, for instance, click the, you know, set up some map view. Um, click the share icon. And you get a URL here that you can put in an email to your friend. Um, and they see what you see. Uh, you can. That gets a little bit more tricky than yes. That's something on the on the roadmap that we want to do to have basically a, a UI for changing styles and things like that. Um, if there are multiple styles in the, for instance, a, a web map service, then you get a drop down so you can choose it. So, oh, actually, so what you see here, right? Um, if there are multiple styles, would you just get the drop down and you can pick one? Thank you. Um, what kind of feedback are you getting? I notice you've got the feedback uh, signal. Is that around data quality, uh, in discrepancies? That's my yep. first question. Yep. Uh, second question, is there a way where people can contribute back to you to show you how they're using the data? So what the different users are, um, and so you're actually tracking um, and understanding how people are using the data and your service? Yep. Um, so I'll answer the second question first. Um, one way of doing that is to just Click the feedback button, feedback button um, send us a message about how you're using it, how you like it, what you don't like, that sort of thing. Um, we, have, we also have Google Analytics connected to this, so we see like a, a top list of layers that people like to use and how long they spend on the site and you know, the standard Google Analytics stuff. So that's, those are probably the, the main two ways. Um, we do a lot of, uh, um, of uh, customer workshops, uh, user workshops. Um, where our user experience team talk to people and figure out how would you like to use it, what data do you want, what works, what doesn't. Um, so that's, that's how we do that. Um, what we receive on the feedback covers the entire spectrum of regular feedback. So there's some terrible, terrible feedback that you know people should just never even write on a keyboard. And there's some really, really good feedback which says, hey, I noticed that for this data, You've got, you know, it looks like this, and I think that's incorrect, and I think you should look into this, and they'll leave their email address, and we'll talk to them, and we'll figure out what's wrong, and often, well, not often, but sometimes, they're right, and we have to fix something. 